Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. Thanks so much for joining us here today. And today is a day about Path of Exile. You're going to find out a lot of awesome stuff we've been working on. Before we get started, though, I wanted to mention that there are Twitch drops that you can win. Below the live stream, there are some instructions for signing up and linking your Twitch account with your Path of Exile account. And if you do that, you'll be eligible to receive the drops. So today's live stream has got four sections. They say you should start your show with a bang, so we're going to start right off with Path of Exile 2. After that, we're going to show you Path of Exile Ultimatum. This is an expansion for regular Path of Exile that's coming out literally next week. After that, we're going to be joined by Ziggy D, who's going to host a Q&A where he asks me a whole bunch of questions from Twitch chat. So if you have any questions about the various reveals, make sure to keep them for the Q&A. Then there's going to be a live episode of the Bay Class podcast, where Taki Cat and his crew of Path of Exile veterans are going to discuss all of the things we've announced today. They'll be joined by Rory Rackham, who's the Grinding Gear Games developer who was in charge of the development of the Ultimatum League. All right, let's get started. You're probably wondering why has it been so long since we last showed you any Path of Exile 2 footage. And honestly, this is because the project is so important to us that we are definitely taking our time to make sure that we make the best possible action RPG. Let's watch a new trailer. Among ancient ruins, Evil grows once more. The seed of corruption advances, spreading dread and despair. We must give chase. That trailer really shows what we have achieved with Path of Exile 2. I am so proud of the efforts of the entire team in putting that together. At ExileCon, we announced that Path of Exile 2 is a true sequel to Path of Exile. So that means a new seven-act campaign, it means a whole new skill gem system, new items, new monsters, character classes, all the Ascendancy classes are completely new, it's got cutting-edge next-generation graphics as you just saw. Basically, it's everything you would expect from a sequel to Path of Exile. But we're not just throwing away our legacy, we're embracing it. Both campaigns will be fully playable from within the same game plan. You'll be able to play through the original Path of Exile storyline or the new Path of Exile 2 campaign on the way to the shared endgame. All of your old characters will still be playable, and of course any microtransaction purchases you've made in Path of Exile will carry on to the sequel. At ExileCon, we introduced the dark forests of the island of Ogham, where you start your journey. Today, we're proud to showcase Path of Exile 2's second act, which takes place in the Vastiri Desert. Welcome to Path of Exile 2's second act. As you saw in the trailer, Act 2 is centered around a caravan of Marraketh called the Ardura who live in the Vastiri Desert. You're chasing another caravan from an opposing tribe called the Faradun. There's a set of large ancient gates blocking the progress of the caravan through a desert pass, so you're being sent through the traitor's passage to unlock them. We shall wait here, Jingak. But the military carts have departed for the gates. Make haste! Path of Exile 2 is a lot more than just new acts. We want combat to feel both brutal and responsive, even at low levels. We're ensuring that each weapon type has unique and different mechanics. Each weapon class feels different to play, and today we're going to start by demonstrating the new spear weapon class. Spears are a weapon class favoring mobility with both melee and ranged attack options. To that end, each spear will grant you at least one mobility skill. 
In this case, the spear comes with both an engage and disengage skill. When you engage, it increases your melee damage for a short time and that really encourages you to be mobile during combat. One of the skills we're using here is called Whirling Slash. When you use Whirling Slash, it creates a sandstorm that grows in size each time you use the skill. When you leave the sandstorm, it explodes, dealing damage to nearby monsters. A great way to do that is to use the Disengage skill, which makes you fly backwards and throw projectiles. PoE 2, each area's mini-boss is a much more substantial fight with interesting mechanics. You'll be able to find at least one mini-boss in each area of the game. One thing I love about this boss in particular is that it destroys the ceiling when it slams the ground, letting in more light. Clever players will notice that if they're standing in the light, then they're not going to have any rocks falling on their head. The rapid assault skill that we're using against this boss does three rapid stabs, followed by a fourth stab that deals more damage and can stun, if you're willing to commit to a long attack time. While developing the skills for Path of Exile 2, we were really thinking a lot about designing skills that could be cancelled early to dodge, or you can commit to the full attack for maximum damage. One of the skills we're using here is called Spear Field, which creates an area of spears coming out of the ground that impel monsters who walk into them, causing them to bleed. As the monsters move towards you, they take damage, so using your mobility skills as a way to move away from them is a great strategy here. In Path of Exile 2, we've invested a lot in our animation system. I'm sure you're noticing the animations are looking a lot better than they did in PoE 1. But there's also a lot of subtle detail, like characters having different run animations depending on how fast they're moving. When we use a Quicksilver Flask here, you can see the character changes to a sprinting animation. Now that we've arrived at the Ancient Gates, we're going to show you another of the new weapon classes in Path of Exile 2, Crossbows. Crossbows are special in that they grant attack skills implicitly. This particular crossbow grants Power Shot, which is a high damage single target attack. In order to modify what Power Shot does, you're going to need to equip Bolt skill gems, which change the type of bolts that are loaded into the crossbow. Here we've got three different Bolt skills that the character can switch between depending on the situation. Armor piercing bolts. Incendiary bolts. Permafrost bolts can be used to disrupt packs of enemies to prevent them from closing in on your position. You can then follow up with armor-piercing bolts to do plenty of damage. Join me in, in this area, we're helping Asala, leader of the Ardura, to open the ancient gates and let the caravan through. Because the bolt types are the skill gems, support gems that are added to them will modify whatever the skill is that you're using. Here we're going to add multiple projectiles to our incendiary bolt. Thank you. 
Path of Exile 2, we're doing a lot more interesting things with monster packs. Here you can see some of the monsters patrolling around. Now we're coming to another example of a Path of Exile 2 mini-boss, Le'im the Impaler. The boss has dropped another type of crossbow, a siege crossbow. This crossbow grants the siege cascade skill. The skill is also modified depending on what type of bolts you're using. We tried to add a lot more little details to combat in Path of Exile 2. You might notice that the monsters who die while burning have charred corpses. We really want to make sure that there's a feeling that as you leave the battlefield, there's clear evidence of what combat took place there. This is the perennial king, the leader of the Faradun. His goal here is to prevent you from catching the caravan at any cost.
Exactly! He conjures the very sands against us! This madness has gone on long enough. The king is not the man I once knew. And sands swallow me if I do any more to enable him. You plan to continue your pursuit, yes? You will not catch him. Not without me. We cannot follow through the raging sands. Let us return to the caravan and question this defector. This is the Ardura caravan, your town in Act 2. I am Asala, the Sekma of the Ardura. I care not where you came from, nor what caste you might have been there. All that matters is that you have shown yourself capable in battle, Jinga. Remain a friend to the Adura, and you shall have nothing but respect from us. From what your shade has told us, the situation is dire. This Balbalic will live or die based on her usefulness in pursuit of the seed of corruption. Ask her what questions you will, then we, Adura, will decide her fate. You need not trust me. You will see the truth of my information soon enough. I ask nothing of you. Only that you do what you know is right. One of the things we really wanted to do in Act 2 was to use the mobility of the caravan to allow the player to choose how they explore the act. Here you're given four options on how to proceed. There is a tribe of lost men that inhabits the Mastodon Badlands. They worship the bones of those long ago beasts, and that faith has given rise to powerful tasks that can somehow call on storms and strike enemies with lightning. The king wishes to steal these objects of worship and use their lightning in war. Do what you must. Though events demand you tread upon the valley of the dead, do not do so flagrantly. Keep your presence light, cleanse what corruption you can, and we shall skirmish with the Faradun to protect your flank. Once you've picked your destination, the caravan will travel to that area and come to a stop so that you can disembark and go on your quest. Because we just got the Storm Sphere skill as a quest reward, now would be a great time to switch back to spears and use some ranged abilities. Storm Spear fires a lightning projectile which splits on contact. The other skill we're using here is called Blazing Lance. Blazing Lance creates a trail of fire from the ground, dealing damage over time. However, if you're willing to stand in place for long enough, you can throw a second spear that will fan the flames for much more damage. We've just found a unique spear, it's called Devata's Wind. This spear has an extra modifier that synergizes really well with Storm Spear. When you disengage, you get two additional projectiles on your projectile skills.
If you have any questions about what you just saw, we'll be doing a Q&A later on. While Path of Exile 2 definitely won't be released this year, we do have a Path of Exile expansion you can play one week from now. I'd like to introduce Path of Exile Ultimatum. You only live once, Exile. Make your choice. A simple ultimatum. Leave with your life and a meager reward, or risk it all for a chance at ungodly riches. For each trial you accept, the challenge grows. But fail and leave with nothing. The reward you deserve. Ultimate reward requires ultimate risk. Face the ultimatum. When some people think of the Val civilization, they think of blood sacrifices, or Queen Atziri, or lost temples in the jungle. But I think of risking your items. From Val Orbs through Double Corruption, the whole Val or No Balls meme, we had to make sure that this expansion was about the concept of risking your items to get great reward. In each area of the Ultimatum League, you'll meet the Trial Master, an emissary of a Val entity only known as Chaos. On behalf of Chaos, the Trial Master enacts trials where exiles must risk an escalating set of valuable rewards as they attempt to overcome progressively more difficult encounters. In each trial, You'll be presented with a reward, an objective, and a selection of difficulty modifiers that make the trial harder. Once you've chosen one of the modifiers, you must then complete that objective under the constraints of that modifier in order to win the promised reward. If you succeed in the challenge, the Trial Master will present you with an ultimatum. Either walk away with what you have earned so far, or risk it all to try to win additional rewards. He'll offer you another item if you can select an additional difficulty modifier and complete the challenge with both modifiers present. If you fail though, you'll lose both rewards and walk away with nothing. If you succeed, you'll be offered an additional reward in exchange for adding yet another difficulty modifier that stacks on top of the current ones. This cycle continues until the rewards become increasingly valuable and the encounter extremely difficult. You'll have to pick a point to end your run and claim your spoils before you make the encounter too hard and lose everything. At its longest, an ultimatum in endgame maps can sometimes have up to 10 fast trials in a row, with a special surprise in the last one. In maps, you'll occasionally find items called inscribed ultimatums. These items can be placed in the map device to transport you to the Trial Master's domain. Each inscribed ultimatum specifies an offering that you must bring with you, a reward you can earn, and an assortment of ultimatum difficulty modifiers. If you're able to complete the trial, the Trial Master will reward you with a specified reward, which is usually worth around twice the value of the item you must bring. For example, you may be asked to risk an Exalted Orb to win a stack of 2, or potentially risk a stack of 5 to win a stack of 10. Naturally, inscribed ultimatums can be traded with other players, so if you don't feel capable of completing a difficult challenge, you may be able to trade it away for a portion of the difference in price between the reward and the item that must be risked. Likewise, if you have a powerful character, you may be able to selectively trade for profitable ultimatums to run. There are also new unique items that can only be obtained from Ultimatum. One such unique is the Glimpse of Chaos Val Mask, which provides powerful benefits to your maximum life, mana, and energy shield at the cost of having severely reduced elemental resistances and no chaos resistance. 
The item can be corrupted multiple times and has unique corruption outcomes, such as removing a random modifier or transforming it into a different random corrupted unique helmet entirely that retains its corruption implicit mod. Another new Val unique item in Ultimatum is Mahuzotl's Machination, which grants you six keystone passives at once. Combining all of these keystones results in some very unusual outcomes, and the item features an entirely new unique keystone as well. We have worked hard to make sure that Ultimatum doesn't punish you for being in a party with other players. Party members compete in trials together, but have separate rewards available to them that will need to be locked in to begin the trial. Each player votes on which difficulty modifiers to select. If there's a draw in votes, the modifier will be chosen at random. If one player wants to take their reward and opt out of the next difficult trial, they're able to do so without stopping the other party members from continuing. Rewards are dropped allocated to the players who earned them. So that's Path of Exile Ultimatum. I can tell you, on release day, a lot of our developers are looking forward to watching Twitch so we can see players risking far too much in order to try to get good rewards. Speaking of rewards, there's a lot to talk about here. We had a look at Path of Exile's past reward systems, and we honestly feel many of them are out of date, many of them kind of lack identity, and to top it all off, like the core drop pool of just items that drop when you kill regular monsters just wasn't really compelling enough. Like, you know that feeling where any monster could drop a mirror? We want that for, for a whole slew of different items. And so we've made a lot of changes to Path of Exile's reward systems. There's a bunch of ones to the core drop pool to keep it really interesting. There's ones to basically every piece of League and expansion specific content. And we're going to go through all of those for quite a while now. And I should mention that every change we're about to discuss not, not only affects the Ultimatum League, but also Standard League too. We started by reviewing which items can drop from monsters and chests in the core game. To make sure the core drop pool remains compelling, we've made various changes. You can now find two additional currency items as core drops, Orbs of Binding from the Harbinger League, and the new Veiled Chaos Orb, which we'll reveal in more detail soon. We've also added five new Atlas base types, like this Energy Shield Recharge Amulet. These drop in specific regions of the Atlas of Worlds and have some powerful new implicit mods. Another topic related to the core drop pool is that of boss runs. Veteran community members will remember when people used to do Val Oversoul or Dominus runs over and over because they were a profitable use of time. Final Act bosses now drop more and better items, giving you a much more satisfying close to a difficult act and a more item-focused approach to getting ready for maps if you prefer. We have also added a bunch of very powerful and valuable League-specific uniques into the core drop pool. This means that they can drop from any sufficiently high-level monster without you having to engage with specialized content. Examples of these are Badge of the Brotherhood, Asylum, Pledge of Hands, Maloney's Mechanism, Brutus's Lead Sprinkler, and Headhunter. The goal of all of these changes is to make sure that every monster you kill in Path of Exile has a chance to drop something incredibly valuable, regardless of what content you're playing. On top of all of that, we have added a handful of new vendor recipes, which let you make some pretty cool stuff. We really miss the days when players were scrambling to try to find unknown recipes, and so we're looking forward to seeing how long it takes for you to discover how these ones work. We have also introduced a new type of reliquary key into the core drop pool for this expansion. If you're very lucky, you can find a Val reliquary key from any monster or chest in Path of Exile. When consumed in the map device, it gives you access to a vault with a chest that drops a special foil version of a Val themed unique item. Each unique has an equal chance of dropping. Due to the value and power level of the items contained within, this is the rarest reliquary key ever added to Path of Exile. The rest of our reward changes relate to items that you can earn by playing past content like prior leagues and expansions. We have two goals here. The first is to add and improve items so that all past content is a compelling set of rewards. The second goal is to make it so that the best way to get any reward is to play the content that is primarily associated with that type of reward. Path of Exile's first expansion, Sacrifice of the Val, introduced a new ultimate boss, Adzeri, Queen of the Val. This fight holds up pretty well these days, considering that it is seven years old, but its rewards really needed a refresh. The Sacrificial Garb base type that drops from Adzeri has been significantly improved with the addition of an implicit mod that grants plus one to the level of all Val gems you have equipped. We have also added two new unique items to Adzeri's drop pool and two more to Uber Adzeri's. One of which is the Atzeri's Rule Judgment Staff, which prevents you from being stunned or having your damage reflected. It grants a skill that alternates between Flames of Judgment and Storm of Judgment when used, as if you absorb the powers of Atzeri herself. Skipping forward to 2016's release of Ascendancy, we have made some changes to how you receive your Labyrinth enchantments. 
Previously, when you completed the labyrinth and went to enchant an item, you couldn't see what random result you'd get. Now, the result for each type of enchantment is shown to you in advance so you can make the right choice. In the Eternal Labyrinth, you're now offered three different helmet enchantments to pick between in addition to the boots and gloves. This will make it a lot easier to find enchantments relevant to the skills you're using and to apply them to appropriate items. In 3.14, we're going to stop giving out unique jewels for each day's fastest labyrinth runs, and we have added these jewels as very rare drops that you might find in the labyrinth's final reward chests. Another highly requested labyrinth-related improvement is that you can now consume an offering to the goddess and a map device to open portals directly to a random trial. This greatly accelerates the speed at which you can find your final trials. We have also added two new labyrinth-specific unique items, including the Scales of Justice Unique Shield, which rewards building your character with a careful balance of life and mana. If used correctly, you'll be granted protection from shock and ignite, as well as additional fire damage. Kadira Perandus now has a much larger selection of unique item rewards. We have also rebalanced all sources of Perandus coins so that Perandus content is still the best place to get them from. A craft introduced in Harvest kind of destroyed the Perandus coin economy, so we're absolutely fixing that at the same time. Essences have been numerically rebalanced and are in general stronger than they were before. Screaming essences can now be used to reroll rare items, in addition to their capability to upgrade items too rare. The four Corrupted Essences have had some of their less useful outcomes improved or replaced. Now, the only way to get the powerful upgrade-only top-tier Essences is through Remnants of Corruption, which come from Essence content. Blessings, the currency used to upgrade Breach Uniques, can now be used to upgrade Breach Stones between tiers also. Abyss Jewels have been rebalanced and are on average more powerful than they were before. We have also buffed Abyss Chests to make sure that they are the best place to get Abyss Jewels. We have also introduced Abyss Scarabs and have added four new Abyss-specific unique jewels, such as Tekrod's Gaze, a murderous eye jewel that increases your main hand critical strike chance and your offhand critical strike multiplier based on how many murderous eye jewels you have equipped. Another example is the Ulaman's Gaze Searching Eye Jewel, which counts how many searching eye jewels you have equipped and grants your projectiles a chance to be able to chain when colliding with terrain proportional to this number. These unique jewels have a chance to drop from any of the unique encounters at the end of the Abyssal Depths, and these encounters are now by far the most reliable way to obtain a Stygian Vice belt. We have added a handful of new beast crafts, such as Add a Mod to a Map, or Add a Mod to an Influenced Item, which consume existing beasts. There are some other aspects of beast crafting that we've been keeping our eye on for a while, and we're taking this opportunity to rework them, so that high-level gameplay is less reliant on obtaining certain beast crafts. Now, when you use a splitting beastcraft recipe on an item, both copies are marked as split, which prevents them from being split again. You cannot imprint split items. One of my favorite reward changes in this expansion is that Incursion's Temple of Atsuatl can now be itemized. Once you have access to the map device, Alva can turn your completed and ready-to-run temple into a tradable object that can be consumed in the map device. This means that players can specialize in either making temples to trade to other players, or trading for temples that are ready for them to run. There have also been a lot of changes to the temple. As you may know, specific rooms in the Temple of Atsuaro can drop unique incursion items that can be later upgraded. Many of these base unique items have been improved in this update. Previously, the temple's boss, the Omnitect, dropped random rare items with special incursion mods on them. Now it also drops rare items with incursion mods based around the themes of the rooms your temple contains. Higher tier rooms cause more rare items. Specific rooms now add specific monster packs to the temple, which results in more monster density, challenge, and reward. Temple mods have been buffed so that if your temple has more high-tier rooms, then it's equivalent to a good map. We have performed a modernization pass on rewards from temple rooms so that they're competitive with rewards from newer leagues. The explosive room also contains some basic chests that can be opened with flash powder kegs if you don't need them for opening a path elsewhere in the temple. Delve has had a big increase to early rewards and a reduction to the quantity of high-tier rewards spawning at very deep depths. The end result is that Delve was a lot more rewarding for almost everyone, but a few extreme players who delve very deep will not be getting quite so rich from it. A big problem with rewards and betrayal is that players deem it not worthwhile to kill Katarina, because it resets your betrayal syndicate board. In this expansion, we have massively increased the incentive for doing this. Now if you manage to kill Katarina, all Syndicate members drop their rewards at one tier higher than they previously would. 
This change required the introduction of a new fourth tier of reward from each syndicate member and encourages the use of a larger variety of syndicate targets and safe house leaders. We have improved rewards that were not as interesting or valuable as the best ones. For cases where we deemed rewards too powerful, we moved them to tier 4 rather than nerfing them. The tier 4 rewards are approximately twice as powerful as tier 3 ones were. We have also added a new unique item to Katarina's drop pool as further incentive for killing her. The Cane of Kulamak drops only from Katarina. Similar to Paradoxica, it has three veiled modifiers that must be unveiled one at a time via Jun. This means that each version of the Cane could be entirely different, and because of the way the veiled modifier system works, you have the chance to get three mods that potentially synergize extremely well, or maybe just a crazy bag of mods that don't work together. Furthermore, the Cane itself scales up the magnitudes of any unveiled modifiers on it. We have made some changes to how unveiling mods works. You still get offered a choice of three mods, but these are now more powerful versions of the existing ones. The powerful ones are unveiled onto items, and the normal versions are the ones you unlock that can be crafted onto items. Also, progress towards unlocking crafting of Veiled mods is at a slightly faster rate than before. Some very powerful Veiled modifiers are now only available at their original strength on the unveiled version of the modifier, and the crafted version of the modifier has been lowered in power. Earlier in the presentation, I alluded to the new Veiled Chaos Orb as an item that has been added to Path of Exile's core drop pool. This new currency item rerolls the target item with new mods, like a regular Chaos Orb does, but one mod is guaranteed to be a Veiled mod. While it can drop from any monster or chest in the game, by far the most effective way of getting it is from Isling and some Betrayal safe houses. We have introduced three new types of incubators, for Blight, Metamorph, and Delirium, and have modernized the rewards from the other incubators. The item yield from chests and blighted maps is now affected by a portion of the map item's quantity, giving you a reason to roll your blighted maps if you can handle the additional challenge. Anointments to blighted maps have been rebalanced and reworked so that each has its own purpose and with a consistent increase in reward as the oils get rarer. This is basically entirely buffs, because one big nerf we needed to do was already done last league. You can now corrupt blighted maps. These can very rarely drop the new tainted oil, which allows you to apply anointments to corrupted items. We have also introduced blighted scarabs. We have added two new types of catalysts themed around speed and critical strikes, respectively. These new catalysts are rarer than previous ones. As discussed in the recent development manifesto, the current 3.13 version of Harvest is too rewarding, so we're rebalancing its crafting and also increasing how often you'll encounter portals to the Sacred Grove. The current version spams you with way too many crafts, so each seed has a chance to grant a craft now, reducing the overall number of crafts you can perform per garden you will encounter the grove 60% more than you did before. Some of the most powerful crafting options have been removed or changed. The heart of the grove encounter is now a map fragment that can randomly drop from tier 4 harvest bosses instead of rarely replacing the entire grove when it spawns. With the release of Ultimatum, Ritual will be added to the core game, with a chance to occur in each map you play. It has also been added to the Atlas passive skill tree system and is available as a sextant mod. Almost every time we release a league, we later roll it into the core game with a chance to spawn in maps. Usually 10%, sometimes 5%. When Ritual is added to the core game, we are standardizing this rate at 8%, which means a small decrease for some leagues and an increase for Harvest. We have rebalanced other things to compensate, like the rate at which Heist Rogues level up. Most Atlas Passive Trees have the same increase in chance for bonus content, meaning they now offer more than double the chance of encountering your preferred content. So I just spent a ton of time describing lots of buffs to Path of Exile's different reward systems, and there was one nerf that I left to last. And this gives us a nerf to a league that I kind of care about a bit. Talisman was one that I kind of led the design on, and players joke that it's my favorite league. Now in the 3.12.3 content update, there was a change to Talismans. Basically, they weren't good enough, so the team decided to add a random anointment to them, which made them a lot more powerful, and also to juice up the mods to make them well rolled. And that was overkill. Like, as you've seen recently, talismans have just been dropping with insane mods and great anointments. And we felt in this expansion, especially because you can use tainted oils in order to uh, redo the anointments on talismans, because now you can modify corrupted amulets. Honestly, they don't need the well-rolled mods anymore. And so we've removed that. Talismans are still compelling, but they're not quite where they were in the last league. Every Path of Exile expansion needs new ways for players to slaughter their enemies. In Path of Exile Ultimatum, this takes the form of four new skill gems and four support gems. In line with Ultimatum's Val theme, these gems focus on blood, the idea of spending life rather than mana to use your skills. 
Alongside the new skill and support gems, we've also made some adjustments to the low life mechanic, including changing the low life threshold to 50%. This makes it much easier and safer to stay on low life for builds where it matters. Typically when players create low life builds, they rely on energy shield to protect themselves against incoming damage. The new skill Petrified Blood enables low life builds to instead use some of their life ball to absorb hits. While it's active, you can't recover life above 50% through any method other than flasks. Sources of life recovery like life regeneration and life leech only apply to the bottom half of your life pool. Additionally, a portion of incoming hit damage that affects the lower half of your life pool is spread out over time rather than being applied instantly. Corrupting Fever consumes a chunk of your life and grants you a buff that causes all your hits to apply Corrupted Blood to your enemies. Corrupted Blood stacks up with each hit, causing more and more physical damage over time. When you have consumed a certain amount of life to cast skills from your life pool, the buff's duration refreshes. Essentially, as long as you're consuming life to use skills, you'll be causing damage over time to stack on enemies. Be careful, though. The Exsanguinate skill shoots tendrils of blood in front of you at the cost of life rather than mana. In addition to a strong physical damage hit, it also applies a physical damage over time debuff which can stack up to three times. You can also support Exsanguinate so that its tendrils chain from one target to the next. Reap conjures a giant bloody scythe that swings across a selected area, applying strong hit damage and physical damage over time. Each use of the skill causes it to gain a charge that scales its damage up and increases its life cost up to five times. These charges drop off over time as well as after killing enemies, making Reap very powerful at stacking up damage against single targets. We've also added two new support gems that have split the existing blood magic support into two separate support gems. The first of these is the Arrogance support, which causes supported skills to reserve life instead of mana and also provides an increase to the effect of auras that it supports. Just like the original blood magic support gem, the reservation multiplier diminishes as the gem levels up. The Life Tap support gem causes supported skills to cost life instead of mana. Once you've consumed a certain amount of life to use a skill, you gain Life Tap, which increases your damage for a few seconds. The Cruelty support gem grants a buff called Cruelty, which increases the damage over time you deal with supported skills. It also boosts the hit damage from supported skills, and the Cruelty buff gets stronger the harder you hit. This gem is designed as an additional option for builds that focus on both hits and damage over time. The Bloodthirst support gem is a new option for low life attackers. This gem adds a percentage of your life as physical weapon damage while you're on low life, letting low life attack based builds really scale their damage, which wasn't an option before. Alongside a Val themed expansion and Blood themed gems, it felt right to take the opportunity to improve Val skills, which are supercharged versions of regular gems that charge up with the souls of your slain enemies to deal huge bursts of damage. One of the main improvements is that you now get far more souls for Val skills from damaging unique enemies, so your Val skills will recharge faster against bosses. We've also improved the Etzeri's Rain unique jewel. Alongside increasing the duration of your Val skills, it also grants a chance to regain all consumed souls. Val skills have also received a balance pass that you can check out in the full Path of Exile Ultimate and patch notes in a few days. So we've covered most of the key components that make up Path of Exile Ultimatum. Keep an eye on the news over the next week as we reveal the finer details of what's coming. We'll move on to the Q&A shortly to answer your burning questions, but first let's have a quick look at the new supporter packs that are available right now to celebrate the launch of Ultimatum and help fund ongoing development of Path of Exile. The Silver Crescent and Imperial Sun supporter packs come with masses of points to spend in the store, social frames, forum titles and badges, a download of the digital soundtrack, and of course, exclusive cosmetic microtransactions such as armor sets, alternate helmets and weapon skins. The Silver Crescent series has an exclusive portal effect and the Imperial Sun series has an exclusive aura effect. Each series has two packs and the smaller packs can be upgraded to their respective large pack anytime while they're still on sale. These are of course in addition to the new core packs that were released at the end of last year. Remember to check those out if you haven't already. Thank you so much for your support. Purchases of these supporter packs are the only thing that fund ongoing development of Path of Exile, its sequel Path of Exile 2, and expansions like Ultimatum. The reveals we showed you today are already live on YouTube for you to link to your friends in case they missed the live stream. Please do so, we're keen to get a big turnout on the release of Ultimatum next week. And we've got plenty more reveals planned for the rest of the year. There's a lot more Path of Exile 2 stuff to show off, and we've also got some new progress on Path of Exile Mobile we're keen to share with you as well. Anyway, if you have any questions from what we've shown you today, please get them ready because I'm about to be joined by Ziggy D as we do a Q&A based on your questions from Twitch chat.